All right, let's go ahead and do chapter six. Like I said, chapter six is really just an intro and an overview. Um, there really isn't much content in here that we're going to um, um, ask questions about on exams. It's just uh, intended to build your vocabulary for what we're going to be doing in terms of organic reactions. Now, in terms of reactions, <clears throat> there are uh, four basic classes that we're going to talk about. In addition, reactions. In addition, we're going to take two molecules and we're going to add them together. We're going to combine them and we're going to make a new substance of some sort. Elimination is just the opposite. We're going to start with some nice, well-behaved um, compound and we're going to split it. So we get two or more new substances. Substitution. In a substitution, what we do is we're going to take one compound, we're going to react it with something, and we're going to exchange parts. So something is going to be substituted for something else. And finally, rearrangement. We've talked about isomers and stuff like that. We can actually take um, a structure and do things to it to cause the constitution or the connectivity to change. So we go from one substance to an isomeric substance. That's called a rearrangement. Rearrangements can actually be a really fun thing to do. Um, trying to figure out exactly how we go from one set to the other. Um, that's one of the great exercises you do in more advanced organic chemistry. An example of a simple addition reaction. We're going to talk about carbon-carbon double bonds, like I said. These are alkenes. The concept of a functional group. We said this back when we did functional groups as an overview. But the concept of a functional group is that all functional groups will have a common set of reactions. And it really doesn't matter what's attached here to our carbon chain. If you simply look and you see we have a carbon-carbon double bond, and we're going to react it with HBr, virtually all alkenes will undergo an addition reaction, and we will form some sort of a bromoalkane. So we are adding HBr. We are losing our double bond here. Here's the HBr that we added. Now, <clears throat> again, this is a very simple addition reaction. We're going to talk in much more detail about exactly how this reaction occurs. But virtually all alkenes are going to do this simple chemistry. Nice thing is, once again, doesn't really matter what's attached. You see you have an alkene, an HBr. All you do is add this to our carbon-carbon double bond to make the bromoalkane. alkene. Makes organic chemistry nice and simple. An elimination reaction. An example, <clears throat> if we have an alcohol, this is ethanol. It's a two-carbon alcohol. This is the alcohol of consumption. <clears throat> we can eliminate from this, the elements of water. We're going to do this by acid, catal acid catalysis. I think we actually do this in lab. But when we do that, we're going to do an alkene, and we're going to form molecular water. Again, we have eliminated water to form the alkene and water. One substance to two. An example of a substitution. Now, an example that we're going to look at here is pretty much a classic in organic chemistry. Um, here we're going to take, whoops, whoa, 
methane is going to react it with chlorine. And we're going to form boromethane NHCl. So in terms of being a substitution reaction, we have substituted one of the chlorines for our hydrogen. That leaves the hydrogen and the other chlorine as our HCl. Start off with a simple alkane, and we go to chloromethane. <clears throat> um, this reaction is infamous in organic chemistry because the first real organic test was Morrison and Boyd. This um, was revolutionary at its time, so in the, in the 60s, early 60s. <clears throat> um, Morrison and Boyd wanted an example of an organic reaction, and so they put this in as the very first thing under reactions. Obviously, everybody taking organic in those days looked at that and said, this must be the most important reaction in all of organic chemistry, which of course it is not. It is absolutely garbage. <laughs> but nonetheless, it became famous. and Everybody spent a huge amount of time talking about this, even though it's very unimportant. We will talk about it a lot, however. And finally, an example of a simple rearrangement. We're going to simply make an isomer. Here we have a simple alkene. This is a 1, 2, 3, 4, so it's a butene. Double bond here in carbon 1, 1 butene. If we take this and we subject it to the presence of an acid, this can actually undergo a rearrangement, rearrange its carbon skeleton. So now the double bond is interior. Instead of 1 butene, it's 2 butene. Um, they're isomers, they have exactly the same formula, but they have different constitutions. They are constitutional isomers. Um, this is an equilibrium. The size of the arrows indicates that this is actually uh, the preferred half of the equilibrium. This is a much more stable compound than this one. Um, and that's because this is a more highly substituted double bond. We'll learn that that is Sysef's rule when we do uh, the chapter on alkenes. All right, let's go and let's look at the mechanism for a simple reaction. To begin with, when we make and break bonds, we're going to show the movement of electrons using these little things. These curved arrows are officially referred to as curvy arrows. Okay? Um, when we have an arrow like this guy, where we have two prongs on our arrow, that is reserved for the movement of an electron pair. So we are moving two electrons at once with this kind of an arrow. What this would indicate is that we are breaking the AB covalent bond, and the electrons are all going to B. That means that B is now going to have these electrons, it will be negative, and A will be short electrons, it will be positive. We can also, this is called a homolytic, I'm sorry, heterolytic um, cleavage hetero because it, one takes it all. In a homolytic cleavage, the first one, what we're going to do is take our covalent bond and we're going to split it so that we wind up with one electron on each atom. Because they both wind up with one electron, they're both neutral. Homolytic cleavage each atom gets one electron. Heterolytic cleavage, one atom gets both. This first one is also, we will refer to this as generating free radicals. A free radical is basically a species with one unpaired electron. Because it only has one, it's very, very reactive. 
in a heterolytic cleavage, we will form something as positive, something as negative. In terms of carbon compounds, this would be a carbocation or a carbanion. Once again, <clears throat> this arrow, half an arrow, <clears throat> one electron, double arrow, standard arrow, two electrons. Any questions? All right, the most famous reaction, as I've said, for the homolytic process is going to be the free radical halogenation of a simple alkane. So let's talk about this. This can actually be described as three separate steps. The first step is going to be initiation. We're going to take and we're going to make these radicals. When we make these radicals, we're going to use something to initiate it. We're going to break a covalent bond, and we're going to form two reactive species, and they each will have one unpaired electron. Once we've made the radicals, we're going to do a free radical propagation reaction. What this is going to mean is that we're going to take our radical that we made up here, going to react it with a nice, happy mo molecule, and we're going to wind up with a new radical and a new um, molecule. This is going to go in a chain sort of thing until we finally hit termination. Termination is just the opposite of initiation. We have these two or three radicals flying around. If they happen to bump into each other, they will again form that covalent bond, and the whole process is over. Because it doesn't happen unless you have three radicals. Here's our example. We're going to take methane, react it with chlorine, going to make chloromethane and HCl. Reaction number one in Morrison and Boyd. So let's take this particular reaction and break it down into our three steps. Step one, initiation. In order to start this reaction, you need to break the bond between the two chlorine atoms. You can do this by heating it up. That works. Put enough energy in, you can split it. The simplest way, however, is to use light. If you simply shine a light on it, <clears throat> um, chlorine will absorb a particular wavelength. The electrons will go to an excited state, and you can split this bond and make two free radicals. This is the common way to do it. Chlorine plus light, we wind up with free radicals. Our next step then is going to be propagation. Remember in propagation, we took a free radical and another molecule. We wound up with a free radical and another molecule. For this particular thing, what we're going to do is let the chlorine radical attack a methane. When it does, it's going to rip a hydrogen atom off. So what it does is it breaks this bond. One electron goes down to the carbon, one goes with the chlorine. We wind up with HCl, with a nice happy covalent bond, and this guy is the methyl radical. So this side, here's a radical. This side, here's a radical. Now to get our product. In this pot, we have lots of chlorine. We have lots of methane. The methyl radical is very reactive. If it bumps into a chlorine, it will um, break this bond here, the chlorine will come and bond to the carbon, giving us a covalent bond for chloromethane, 
This electron goes with chlorine to give us the chlorine radical. Now, how do we know this is a chain reaction? Because we started with a chlorine radical, we end up with a chlorine radical. So it just does the same thing over and over and over and over again, doesn't it? That's a chain reaction. Start it once, and it goes. It goes until it hits termination. So instead of chlorine radical hitting one of these guys, in termination, chlorine radical hits another radical. It can be almost anything. Here I've made it a methyl radical that happens to be floating around. <clears throat> These will form a bond. We have no more radicals. Boom, the reaction's over. Other termination steps. Two chlorines could undo the process and go back to Cl2. <clears throat> Here's the one we just saw, methyl radical plus chlorine radical. We can also take two methyl radicals, and by gosh, we make ethane. All of these go from radicals on one side, not on the other, and that stops the process. Any questions? Now, I said at the start of the chapter here that there are um, many things that are going to show up on exams. That's not entirely true. Classic exam question here is to show all of the steps in the halogenation of something. So um, let's go ahead and use methane again. Remember, if I ask you that question, you need to show the three steps. Step one has to be an initiation. So usually this is a halogen of some sort with light to give radicals. Step two is our free radical propagation chain reaction. Start with chlorine radical, end with a chlorine radical. That's how you know it's a chain. Okay? Let's pull off hydrogen atom, get HCl, leave a radical. That reacts with chlorine, forms a radical, and chloromethane. Finally, I always ask for an example of a termination step. It can be any of them. This one works fine. Any questions? Now, when we do the chapter on free radicals, maybe it's chapter 10, I don't know. We'll talk about this in much more detail. And we'll talk about why this really is a lousy uh, reaction in organic chemistry. But I'll give you a hint. The reason is that once we make chloromethane here, chloromethane could also react with a chlorine radical, couldn't it? No reason it couldn't. In fact, it will react faster than methane does. Going through the sequence, that would give us dichloromethane. That, in turn, reacts faster than chloromethane. Going through the sequence, we then get trichloromethane, or chloroform. That actually reacts even faster. One more cycle, we would get carbon tetrachloride. So the reason this is a lousy reaction is that the selectivity is very, very poor. You would actually get very little chloromethane and lots and lots of other isomers. But we'll do that in Chapter 10. Any questions? All right. Let's talk about polar reactions. And these are going to be the other type of substitution reactions. These are actually much more important than the others. Here we're going to take <coughs> um, something that we will define as a nucleophile, and we're going to react with something that we will call an electrophile. Now, a nucleophile is something that can function as a Lewis base. 
Another way to think about it is that it has extra electrons. Nucleophile means it's looking for something positive. Okay? It's looking for a nucleus. Chloride anion is a fine example of a nucleophile. This is chloromethane. Chloromethane is going to be our electrophile. Now this is called polar reaction mechanism. Remember we talked about the covalent bond here between the carbon and the chlorine. Because chlorine is more electronegative, this bond is polarized. <clears throat> What's, when this is polarized, that leaves this carbon positive. Chloride has extra electrons, and the carbon is electron deficient. In a polar substitution reaction, what's going to happen is our nucleophile will attack the electrophile, and then we will break this bond. The process looks something like this. This is chloride. This is chloromethane. Once again, we have a partial positive charge here. This is our nucleophile. Important to remember the nomenclature. This is the electrophile. This is looking for electrons. This is looking for a positive charge. We will show this substitution reaction using an arrow. It will be a regular double-headed arrow. The electrons will go from the chlorine they will attack the carbon. We will then break this carbon-chlorine bond, wind up with chloromethane and chloride. Now clearly, if we had done this with bromide, we would get a new product, wouldn't we? We would get bromomethane, and we'd kick out chloride. <clears throat> Once it starts to attack, we wind up with the equivalent of five bonds on this carbon. Can't have that, can we? That's why we have to break this carbon-carbon bond here. <clears throat> this is our nucleophile. This chlorine here, this guy, is called the leaving group. Nucleophile and leaving group. <clears throat> this is a cute little movie showing the process. Chloride comes in, we break this bond, and we're over here. It can also go backwards. <clears throat> You'll note that at no point in this do we have five bonds to this carbon. And also note what happens to this carbon's stereochemistry. It goes planar, then pops this direction, goes planar, and then pops this direction. This is undergoing a stereochemistry inversion. We will see that if this was a chiral center, we could start off with R. On this side, then, we would have S. S would then be converted to R as it went back. Any questions? All right, we'll return to this a little bit later when we talk about reaction coordinate diagrams. But are there any questions here on the concept? All right. An addition reaction. We talked about this. Here we have one, two, three carbon alkene, so it's a butene, isn't it? We're going to react this with HBr. We know, because this is a functional group reaction, that we are going to add the HBr to our double bond. When we do this, we wind up with a bromo-alkane. Now, what we're going to do is talk about this reaction step by step. question we're going to ask is, how in the world does this happen? And how can you predict the product? 
starting with our alkenes. The fact is, the only product that you will get here is 2-bromopropane. That means that the bromine only goes to carbon-2 here. It never goes to carbon-1. We'll call this Markonikov's rule, and we're going to explain in great detail the uh, next chapter of why. But here's just an overview. Well, we start off with our bromo, I'm sorry, our uh, propene. Remember our carbon-carbon double bond has a sigma bond, and it has a pi system. That's where the second bond is. This actually looks something like this. <clears throat> this is just two carbons, but remember in the electrostatic potential map, we have the, this pi system up here. It's a very, very rich source of electrons. Now, we're doing this in the presence of a proton, right? We have to initiate this reaction somehow. If you were a proton, something positive, where would you want to go? Just nice, happy little pillow of electrons, wouldn't you? So, here's what we're dealing with. Here's our pi system. And we see that this is a nice source of electrons. We have an acid present. The first thing that's going to happen is this proton is just going to come sit on this pi system. Just sits down, makes itself comfortable. This is called a protonated pi cloud. Now, your book doesn't talk much about that. Um, that's a shame. <clears throat> um, John McMurray is a physical organic chemist. He certainly knows that, but he somehow thought that was too difficult to include. But it makes it very easy to predict or understand why we get one product and not the other. So if we start off with this thing just sitting on this pi system, OK, just sitting there. There are two things that could happen. This hydrogen could slide to this carbon, or it could slide over to this carbon. If it slid over to this carbon, right here, we get this. Now this end of our alkene has a methyl and hydrogen, a sigma bond, but that's only three bonds, so it's positive. It's called a carbon cation. If it slid over this way, we would have two hydrogens and a methyl here, and three hydrogens and a sigma bond here. This is also a carbon cation. <clears throat> the fact is that the only carbon cation that we form is this one. This guy is not observed. We will see that that's a very simple um, fact or feature of the fact that this carbocation is secondary. That means it's attached to two carbons, isn't it? This is attached to only one carbon. That's primary. The more carbons you have on a carbocation, the more stable it is. What we're doing here is simply forming the most stable carbon cation. This is the basis, the theoretical basis of Markonikov's rule. Now, Markonikov's rule is glibly stated as them that has gets. Okay? He was Russian. Them that has gets. This carbon has one hydrogen. This carbon has two hydrogens. The carbon that has the most hydrogens gets the hydrogen. <clears throat> That's one way to look at it. That's a very simple way. The way we're going to do is to simply justify Markonikov's rule as we're going to form most stable carbocation. 
secondary as opposed to primary. Again, we'll do this in great detail next chapter. Once we have the carbocation form, the second step in this reaction is to make our product. This happens by taking the carbocation, reacting it with bromide anion, and we get our product. This is a very, very fast reaction because we have two charged species. As soon as they can bump into each other, they react. This is a much slower reaction. <clears throat> when we describe this, we're going to do it using a reaction coordinate. Again, we're going to cover that in a minute. But the reaction coordinate will simply allow us to assign energies to our fast and our slow steps. Let's also look at a mechanism here for an elimination reaction. Now, we saw we could take an alcohol in the presence of acid, and we could make an alkene. A classic reaction that we might even do in lab this semester, I'm not sure, um, is to take something like tert-butyl alcohol. So here we have three methyl groups. There's our carbon with an OH. And we're going to react it with sulfuric acid. We are going to make an alkene. How would you figure this is going to happen? Remember I said the um, unshared pairs of electrons on the oxygen are the key thing in understanding oxygen's reactivity. Because this has unshared pairs and here's a proton, we can simply protonate this, <coughs> eliminate it. Oh, here's the alkene that we're going to make. So let's go through the mechanism. Step one, we are going to take our proton, add it, and make this guy. Now, as you look at this, you say, oh, wow, you know, that looks odd, but it doesn't. Remember back in general chemistry, <clears throat> this looks a lot like hydronium ion, doesn't it? H3O plus. We're very familiar with this. This also, if we broke this bond, um, heterolytically gave the electrons to the oxygen, this would be water, wouldn't it? So step one in our mechanism, we're going to protonate this guy to make this intermediate. Step two, we're going to break this bond, and this is going to break heterolytically to form a carbocation, this part goes off as water. Now again, what the arrows mean here, and this is a regular arrowhead, so this is a heterolytic cleavage. Both of these electrons go to the oxygen to make water, leaving this carbon electron deficient. It is a carbon cation. Now, to make the alkene, what we have to do is get rid of one hydrogen. All we have to do is take a base of some sort, yank this hydrogen off, move these electrons in, and presto, we have the ion. Step one, we form the carbocation. That's slow. Step two, we do our elimination, get our neutral molecule, that's much faster. Yeah. So, like, the base kind of takes away that hydrogen and that bond moves down? Yep. Okay. That's what these arrows are designed to show. What's the base, though? Uh, the base can be anything. We have sulfuric acid in there. It could be sulfate anion or hydrogen sulfate. Could be water. Anything that can pull off this proton. This is um, a fairly acidic carbon hydrogen because once you get rid of this, you form a nice stable product. All right, let's take all of this 
these three types of reactions. And let's look at them in terms of what I was talking about earlier, the reaction coordinate diagram. Now, in a reaction coordinate diagram, what you're basically doing is using an arbitrary vertical scale to represent ground state energy. We're going to start with reactants, we're going to go to products, and arbitrarily we're going to show the energy of the species that are involved. Our progressive reaction looks something like this. So these things have to be shown in our reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinate is going to look something like this. We're going to start off with our starting material here. Here I have chloromethane and chloride. We know in our mechanism, chloride is going to attack, this bond is going to break, and we're going to make chloromethane and again chloride. So it's a symmetrical reaction. We're going to show an arbitrary energy scale going up. The higher you are on the thing here, the higher the ground state energy. We're going to start with our starting material down here somewhere. We're going to go through an energy maximum and make our products. This energy maximum here, this is where we are making this bond. At the same time, we're breaking this bond. <clears throat> this energy maximum is referred to as a transition state. You use this little uh, dagger sign to represent a transition state. Now, it's important to remember that a transition state is not uh, an intermediate. It's simply an energy maximum. In order to go from here to here, we have to make a bond and break a bond. That requires energy, and that puts us way up there. Go back to our movie. This is the reaction coordinate corresponding to our movement. Here's the product. Here's our transition state, where it's planar. When we're in the process of making and breaking, that's our energy maximum. We'll refer to this as a concerted reaction. Concerted means that everything happens at once, like magic. There is no intermediate. Bond making, bond breaking happens simultaneously. Okay? That's just the nomenclature. Yeah? Why is this important? Why is it important? Yeah. Because we're going to distinguish between concerted and stepwise reactions. <clears throat> um, in stepwise reactions, we're going to have distinct intermediates. In concerted reactions, we do not. Intermediates um, can give rise to side products. They can partition different ways. A concerted reaction, one set of reactants, one set of products. Speaking of stepwise reactions, we talked about this. We know that if we took an alkene plus HBr, we will get a bromoalkene alkane. Again, the only one we get is the two bromo propane. Okay? If we wanted to show this using a reaction coordinate, our first step is going to be protonation of our pi cloud. We're not going to show that. But we're going to form our intermediate. That's the carbocation. Now, this is the ground state energy. The carbocation is a reactive intermediate. This can have a higher energy. So the process of getting from here to here is going to look something like this. This is our intermediate right here. 
Okay? Higher of energy than where we started. Once we make this intermediate, we said that this thing reacts quickly, doesn't it? Reacts rapidly. And this little hill is how we show a fast reaction. The higher the hill, the more energy it takes. This takes lots of energy to get there, little tiny bit to get down to products. This is the slow step. This is the fast step. This has a distinct intermediate and has two humps. Remember our fast step, bromide anion attacks the carbocation anion, and boom, we're down to here. This is our slow step. This is our slow transition state. This is our fast transition state. Is that energy activation, activation energy? Yep, exactly. Activation energy goes from here to here. How much it takes to get to the transition state. Transition state is also called the activated complex. Big energy, slow step, little energy, fast step. Let's also use a reaction coordinate diagram to look at Mark Conicost rule. Oh, I guess we're not going to do that yet. Um, you ask why this is important. <clears throat> this is an enzyme. Enzyme is a large polyamide that adopts and has a primary structure, adopts a secondary, and then a tertiary structure. Um, this enzyme will bind a substrate. The substrate is some chemical compound. The way it binds it, it will move that particular substrate towards its transition state for some reaction, whether it be bond cleavage or whatever. If this red line shows what happens when we have an uncatalyzed reaction, so no enzyme, it takes lots of energy to get up there. That's our activation energy. If we bind our substrate to the enzyme, however, and push it halfway or so towards its transition state, the activation energy is now very, very small and we have a very fast reaction. This is the way enzymes work, by lowering the activation energy, making the thing faster. All right. <clears throat> let's look at these guys. And let's go back to um, our fluorination reaction. Remember I said that one of the <clears throat> problems with the chlorination reaction was that we had a very poor selectivity. Now we were dealing with methane. Methane only has one type of hydrogen, doesn't it? All four hydrogens are the same. But imagine you were dealing with a more complex molecule and you tried to do the chlorination. Every carbon-hydrogen bond is going to be slightly different in some of these compounds, and you're going to get multiple products. So here's a standard, this is an old exam question. <clears throat> uh, which of these will give a single monochlorination product? Now what are we really asking here? What we're really asking is, how many hydrogens? How many different kinds of hydrogens are there in these compounds? Take just a moment. Look at our collection here. And see if you can figure out how many different kinds of hydrogens there are 
All right, well, let's just do one <coughs> to start with. Let's do A here. This is ethane, isn't it? The hydrogens on each of these carbons are identical, aren't they? They're both simple sp2 carbons. Um, one carbon-carbon bond. They each have three hydrogens. There's symmetry. They're identical. So this guy only has one type of hydrogen. This guy, however, we have methyl hydrogens on the ends and a CH2 hydrogen in the middle. So this would have two types of hydrogen. So go ahead and finish up the rest of the set. How about cyclohexane? All of these are secondary carbons, aren't they? All the CH2s are the same. Now, you could argue that we have axial and equatorial, correct? But remember, they're exchanging 10 to the 6 times per second. So that's a blur. They're all the same. This only has one type of hydrogen. How about this guy? We have methyl, 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 and we have CH2s. <clears throat> These methyls are different than this methyl, correct? These are attached to a quaternary carbon. This is attached to a CH2. So this methyl and these methyls are different, <coughs> and of course the CH2 is different. This guy here, we have methyl on the end, methyl on the end. They're identical, aren't they? And finally, if we have hexamethylbenzene, all of these are attached to simple sp squared carbons. Therefore, these guys are the ones that only have one kind of hydrogen. Now, the point of chapter six, once again, was to introduce you to the concept of a reaction mechanism, to the concept of a reaction coordinate and to give you the vocabulary, addition, elimination, substitution, nucleophile, electrophile, whatever. Very simple chapter. Chapter 7, we're going to get serious and talk about carbon-carbon double bonds, all of their reactions, and there are a huge number of them, huge number. We'll do our very best to make it very simple, however. Okay? On Thursday, we have lab. Um, I believe it's the thin layer chromatography because we're a week off in our labs now. Um, but I will send you um, the, uh, the exact uh, thing by email. There's also a TLC video um, that you might want to look at. Okay? All right. Have a good day.